Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the to the lecture uh, to the Geos Distinguished Lecture Series. This is the this is the second uh, lecture that we have of this uh, uh, of this new thing that we started, and uh, it's it's uh, it's a great pleasure to have uh, Professor Petros Ioannou today from the University of Southern California. Uh, as you know, the idea of, uh, of the um, uh, GEOS Distinguished Lecture Series is to bring world-known, uh, world-class uh, um, uh, academics and, uh, and industry people to, to Cyprus to talk about some of the things that are some of the, to present their research and some of the, and some of the ideas about where the technology is going. So in this framework, uh, uh, Professor Ioannou is one of the top people uh, in controls as well as in the intelligent transportation area. So it's a great, uh, it's a great pleasure and, and, and an honor to have him here with us uh, at the University of Cyprus and at the uh, GEO Center. So uh, Professor Ioannou um, got his um, uh, uh, got his undergraduate degree at the University College London uh, uh, in the UK, then went to do a PhD at, uh, uh, at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and then um, after that, I got a faculty position in the, uh, at the University of Southern California. So he's a, he's a chair professor at the University of Southern California. Um, uh, Petros Ioannou has received uh, many, many awards, his, uh, including the, uh, the Axel B. Uh, Best Paper Award of the IEEE Control Systems Society. Uh, in 2009, he received the IEEE Inter Intelligent Transportation System uh, Society Outstanding Application Award. And uh, in 2012, he received the um, uh, outstanding research award from the Transportation Society, and and also the IEEE Transportation Technologies Field Award in 2016. This, so this is the top award of the of the in the International Transportation Society. So this is a very prestigious award, and he's uh, he's a fellow of the IEEE, a fellow of IFAC a fellow of the IET and a fellow of, uh, of AAAS. And he has, uh, he has co-authored eight books and, uh, and more than uh, 400 uh, uh, research publications. So he's uh, very well known. And uh, of course, uh, from a, a personal viewpoint, is, he's also my PhD advisor. So it's a, it's a great pleasure for me to to have him here today, and uh, um, uh, I have learned quite a lot uh, from him as uh, when I was doing my research, my PhD, and beyond. When, so when I started his uh, at the University of Southern California, uh, the first thing he told me is that uh, you're the third Cypriot student that uh, that uh, starts working with me. And the other two haven't finished, so at some point they left. So, <laughs> so he said, uh, "I hope you do better than the other two." And uh, and the other thing that I remember is that when I was working on my first uh, journal paper, I was working on it for a long time, for you know, like a year. I thought I was finished, ready to send it, and then and then we started working on it, and then by the time that we finished. Uh, the paper was completely in red ink, and then uh, so basically we had to to rewrite uh, rewrite it again. But uh, this was a, a great learning experience, and uh, and uh, and uh, I learned a lot not only to do research and also but also to how to write the research and how to present the research. So um, it was a it was a great experience. So. Uh, so without uh, further taking time, uh, it's, uh, please, uh, welcome, uh, please welcome Professor Ioannou, who today is going to talk about traffic flow control uh, closing the loop.
Well, let me first uh, thank Professor Poligarpu for his nice words. Uh, I hope everybody knows now why out of three he's the one who stayed. <laughs> uh, and the, if you want the proof for that, look at Kios, right? The, the, the remarkable center that uh, uh, it's unbelievable that in a small country like that, you have such a big operation and you have a seminar room uh, full of people, um, which is really impressive uh, in a tiny island like Cyprus. So let me also thank uh, Professor Polycarpo and the Kios team for inviting me. It's always a pleasure to be on these grounds. Um, I tried to come to the University of Cyprus one time. I stayed here for a year. I left for unknown reasons. But um, everything happens for a good reason or, uh, and life goes on. So in any case, I will uh, talk to you about the topic that uh, the nice thing about the topic I'm going to talk is everybody knows something and everybody has something to say. Okay? So you'll see as you go along. Because it's something that we are all affected, we all experience. We, we will, sometimes we enjoy, sometimes we get frustrated, right? And, uh, but before that, I'll uh, give you uh, an outline. Uh, I'm sure uh, the young uh, generation now, you're looking on the internet, you hear a lot of things about automated vehicles, automation in general. Uh, a lot of things are changing. Um, in the area of uh, uh, information technologies. You see the cell phones, the gadgets. When I went to USC, a colleague of mine in communication, communications, he said to me, in a few years, you're gonna have a little box in the size of a credit card, and you're gonna have everything in here. Okay, and it, I didn't believe it then, but it just happened, just a few decades later. Uh, so I'm going to give you the outline of my talk. I'm going to give you a brief history of this automation in transportation, in vehicles. I will talk a little bit about this first level of automation that I, was, I work on it, uh, which is called adaptive uh, cruise control. Uh, a little bit about the current trends, where are we going with this automation and so on. And then I will become a little bit more technical with some equations uh, or some things that we did. Um, and I will talk about connectivity and, you know, and so on. So in the 80s uh, and 90s, um, there was a lot of talk about uh, how do we make the existing transportation system more efficient, you know. So in the old days, you, you get more capacity now, by building roads, right? So you have the highway system, like in Los Angeles, you have a, a, a complicated network of uh, highways. But soon enough, people drive, it gets congested. And then you can't build, you cannot build more highways because there is no space. There are uh, houses and so on. So the idea was, why don't we use technology to make the existing system, the existing road network, much more efficient? And some of the ideas uh, came under the label automated highway systems, uh, or called smart cars and highways, uh, where one prominent idea was that came out of initially MIT in the 60s, and then the guy who did his PhD moved to Berkeley as a researcher, and he became like a religious about it. Like if you take vehicles and put them to follow each other with one meter apart, and you have them speed up at 60, 65 miles per hour, then you, know, you can increase the capacity of the existing highway by four times. So currently it's about 2,000 vehicles per hour per lane. You can make it up to 8,000. Why one meter? One meter is short enough so that if, there is some, if something goes wrong, there's not enough space and time to create a big difference in speed so if there is a collision, it's going to be slight, okay? So of course, that was a wrong assumption because you assume things are in one dimension. Anyway, at that time, when we, we got involved into the uh, transportation area, Marius was there, we follow a different approach because I had a connection with uh, Ford Motor Company with some projects, and we said, we are not going to do this one meter, but we're going to pay attention to safety. In other words, we're going to create a bigger spacing 
but still you can have vehicles organized in a platoon. And we work and we develop what is called the adaptive cruise control, where the vehicle has a radar in the front, now it's a commercial item. It, uh, it gets, uh, measures the relative speed, and the computer decides when to use the brake and the, and the gas, so you can keep a certain spacing, which spacing is not fixed, it's proportional to the time, so you call it time headway. Higher speed, bigger spacing. And the idea is that if something goes wrong, the computer has enough time to sense it and apply the brakes and stop. And because of those efforts, uh, uh, I mean, uh, Ford commercialized the system four years before any other company. Now every company has it, okay? And Marius described the awards I received for that. I didn't even know about it because we did it, we got the money, and we move on with life. But they la later on told us that, uh, listen, what you did in 92 help us uh, produce this, make it commercialize the product um, uh, much faster than anyone else. So this thing with the one meter apart kept going. Uh, the Federal Highway Administration put about $400 million, and the idea was show us a demonstration uh, in 1997. So we participated in that activity, and we were sure enough, we organized vehicles in platoons, one meters, two meters apart, and we put them on a the highway on north of San Diego, and everything was, was working. You can always do the experiment. It's not a big deal. Um, however, the director of the transportation, federal transportation system, changed. He didn't believe in it. The auto companies were very much against it, so the whole thing collapsed. So all this money and all these operations, all of a sudden, were ended. And then they said, we are not going to do these crazy things. We're going to do, uh, we're going to pay attention to safety. So it, it turned out a new initiative, a new name, Intelligent Vehicle Initiative, which was focused was on safety. Then DARPA came in, the military agency came in and says, I'm going to support this idea because the military has a lot of had a lot of incentives. They want military uh, automated tanks, automated artillery, which you have right now, drones and things like that. We're talking about 1997, okay? So now we know they, they exist, but that time they, we didn't know, but DARPA was interested. So DARPA said, we're gonna have, we're not gonna pay people to do research, but we're gonna have a competition. So whoever comes up with the, an automated vehicle that is gonna go from outside Los Angeles to Las Vegas, on a, on a road that I'm gonna, on a route that I'm gonna give you the points, the GPS points, the morning of the competition, the winner, whoever gets there first with 10 hours less, will get one million. So the first time nobody won, the second time there was a winner from Stafford, then uh, uh, Carnegie Mellon, and so on. And then, Okay, so the competition was, they had another competition, and in Europe they had a competition, but then Google comes in and develops the Google cars, which are fully automated, going into traffic. Tesla, also automated vehicles. And now everybody is creating fully automated vehicles. Okay, so that's the story, if you hear the... So, uh, a few words about the system I work on is, was the first successful vehicle automation. You have automation in the longitudinal direction. You can do vehicle following without the driver touching the brakes or the gas, just holding the wheel. Um, despite liability issues, everything worked fine. There was no complicated uh, sensors other than the radar. That is pretty good. And there was a lot of work that we pay attention. Uh, we work on a lot of things to make it to the point of being commercialized. that has to do with human uh, uh, factors, uh, safety analysis, failure modes, and effects analysis. Marius is an expert in that area. And you have to take into account that the vehicle is driven by a 60-year-old up to 90-year-old and above. You know, probably there's a 100-year-old person that still drives. So you have to think about how these people perceive all these things. Um, and how do they feel the acceleration, deceleration generated by the automatic system? How will they react? Will they panic? And so on. So anyway, these are some of the curves from experiments we did. Uh, I don't have time to go into these things. that are showing string stability. There's a, you know, one, the solid line is the lead vehicle. The 
discontinuous is the following vehicle. You can see how it tracks very well, but it does it in a smooth way, so the driver doesn't get, uh, the people in front of the wheel doesn't get panic when the vehicle takes off, and so on. So, um, so that was the first uh, uh, thing we worked on back in the 90s. So the question comes, what is the transportation problem? What is the problem that we are faced today that automation is going to solve? So if you live in a big city, anywhere in Europe, even in Nicosia you experience that, you're going to see that's a picture you see. Often there's an accident, everybody's piling up, people upstream coming in don't know that there's a closed lane, there's really no information. However, the transportation is not just that. Transportation is a far more complex system because it's interconnected. We are not only moving people, but we are moving goods and food and freight. So if there's an earthquake in a big city or a disaster, the first thing you're worried about is food and water. It's not whether you're going to be able to go to work, right? If you don't go to work, you're going to meet your neighbors you haven't talked to for a long time. So the movement of goods and freight is very fundamental to the survival of people. So that has to be, because the system is interconnected. In other words, the rail, uh, is the, the rail tracks are used by freight tr uh, trains and by passenger trains. The road network is used by trucks and vehicles. So if something happens to the network, you're going to see the effect in the port. If there is a strike in the port, labor strike, you're going to see it in the road and so on. You're going to see the effect in the road. So you have to look at the system as a connection of different networks which one affects the other. It's an interconnected system of systems. So it's a non-linear dynamic system of interconnected systems. It's open loop most of the time because people who are not familiar with controls and the, what this open loop means, it means there is no feedback. There's an accident ahead of you, you have no idea what's going on. Because if you knew, the summer would tell you, yeah, slow down, change lanes, you know, that would be a control variable. Another control variable will be, you see on traffic lights that measures the traffic and decides how many people to let go in. Another control variable is pricing, making, uh, putting a cost, controlling the, uh, the, the, the use by uh, putting a price. So the higher the price, the higher the congestion, the higher the price, so it discourages some people from driving. And where there is uh, some feedback is ineffective because there are no sensors everywhere. And the biggest problem of controlling traffic is the lack of sensor data and connectivity. You simply, even if you want to control and manage traffic, there are no data. You have data close to the traffic light the inter intersection, but if you're driving from here to Limassol, with there's traffic, you don't know what the flow is at any point. And the question, well, when you put all these problems, you say, well, what is the problem? We all drive, we all go to work, we go shopping, there is no problem. Well, there is a cost to that. And the cost is congestion, is the inefficient utilization of infrastructure, safety, pollution, long travel times. How do you measure cost? It's another important issue because pollution creates health problems, right? People die sooner. How do you cost human life? How do you calculate the cost of the loss of human life? So it gets very complicated, okay? So what we really need to do, what we really need to do is to have a system like that where the, there is a feedback from here. Right now, these uh, lines not connected. So if we have data connectivity, if vehicles communicate with each other and the infrastructure and so on, then you're going to have better information about traffic. Then you can take all that data, filter it out, get the data that have the information, and develop a traffic controller that controls the traffic. The control inputs will be a series of diff a vector of different things, and I already mentioned uh, could be variable speed limits, changing lanes, pricing, ram metering, traffic light control, and so on. So, however, you don't hear when you go to transportation or on conferences, you don't hear about all these feedback control. You hear about autonomous vehicles, as they call it. 
You make the vehicle autonomous. What is the vehicle autonomous? You want to get rid of the driver, okay? So they want the vehicle to be, uh, not to have a driver. So the driver is sitting in the back, he's reading his book, he's doing something else, and the vehicle takes off. The, however, it's unknown whether that would help the traffic because you are not getting rid of the vehicle. The vehicle is the one which causing the congestion. Get rid of the driver. Of course, the people who sell it, they say, uh, well, if the computer controls the car, it will be safer because uh, the human, most of the accidents are due to human errors. Uh, however, if you look at the car statistics in the US, there is one death per 100 million miles driven. In other words, the probability of getting killed in a car accident per mile driven is about 10 to the minus eight. So that's a very, very low probability uh, that if you put an autonomous vehicle, it, have, it has a very tight uh, objective to achieve. 10 to the minus eight. I mean, any sensor you me you put in, you know, it has to have that reliability. So it's a very tough problem. Okay. Um, and the reason that it makes it even tougher is that we talk. There is no technology today that gives you 100% accurate perception of the environment. Okay. There is no camera that is going to look outside and it's going to interpret everything as well as a human, as a healthy human. So that's one deficiency right there. Okay. Also, autonomous vehicles will have to take uh, very conservative maneuvers, and that will affect the traffic flow. For example, when you, um, <clears throat> when you drive, people cut in front of you, right? One meter, two meters. That situation is very dangerous, because if the driver decides to slow down, you're going to hit. There is not enough time to react. And people hit each other once in a while, right? So an autonomous vehicle is going to be designed not to do that. Because if you do, if it's designed to do that, then there will be liability issues, the lawyers will be dancing and collecting money and so on. So they're not going to be designed like that. So the Google car, for example, if it goes to an intersection, it will not cross the intersection unless everywhere is empty. That means in Los Angeles, it will stay there forever. <laughs> so um, now, whether vehicles are manually driven or autonomous, when you put them in the system of traffic, you create another dynamic system on a higher level that you still need to control. You need to manage traffic. So you control the vehicle on the local level, but the vehicle interacts with other vehicles. So you create slowly a dynamic system of, of uh, which has different characteristics than the dynamics of the individual vehicle. And that's a part that we'll talk. So we feel that what people should be working on is, or the big revolution rather in uh, transportation is gonna come with connectivity. When all these vehicles who are coming up right now, they have uh, Bluetooth, they have Wi-Fi, they're gonna have uh, GPS for other reasons, for navigation and so on. And that uh, will generate a lot of data like position day, I'm here and I'm driving with that speed. Or I'm here, I'm driving with that speed and I'm going to that destination. If that if the infrastructure creates a system that collects that information, they will be able to manage traffic much more effectively, to come up with methods that optimize things, control things much better, okay? So that's, the, that's what we think is gonna create the big revolution in transportation in terms of managing traffic. Not the autonomous vehicles because, as I said, you are getting rid of the driver and the driver is not the cause of congestion but the number of vehicles is. So here is one example of um, an open loop system where there is five lanes and there's an accident in the center lane. And watch what's happening, okay? So the vehicles come there, they don't know what's going on. They come at the end, they go to a full stop and they cut and they cross to the other lanes, okay? What do you think is happening here? If the, the, so you have five lanes and one of them is blocked and there are four lanes. So, so if each lane has 2,000 vehicles per lane, 2,000 times five is 10, right? You close one, you expect 8,000 vehicles per lane. However, you don't get 8,000 vehicles per lane after the accident. 
because the, number, the flow is proportional to the speed. When the vehicles, when the open lanes are moving 65 miles per hour, and the other vehicles stop in, the, in front of the accident, they cut, they slow down the other vehicles in the other lanes. So the vehicle is moving from zero speed, cutting across a vehicle that is moving 65 miles per hour. So you bring the speed down to 30, 40 uh, miles per hour average. So instead of seeing in the open lanes 8,000 vehicles, uh, vehicles flow, you see something six. So this is what we call capacity drop. The drop, the capacity drops because of these force lane changes. Here is another, uh, some people probably saw this before, uh, lack of connectivity, because we think with trucks, you have vehicles of different dynamics. The truck is heavier, it takes longer to stop, but it also obstructs your view. So watch, What's happening here with this vehicle who's trying to go to the other lane? He doesn't see what is there. It's gone. Okay, this could happen to any one of us, right? It's a very special case that the visibility. So in addition to the tracks being slower and heavier and so on, they also obstruct your vision. If there was connectivity, then you knew exactly where every vehicle is. So let me go back to this problem that I mentioned before and say, okay, here is a problem that I explained to you what's happening. Let's see if I can control this system, okay? Let's see if I assume now that all the vehicles communicate, they communicate with the infrastructure, the accident is being detected, and the infrastructure wants to decide how to deal with this situation to eliminate this capacity drop. So the first thing you want to do is to uh, tell the vehicles to change lanes earlier, right? And the question, of course, comes, how earlier? If you go too far, it's, you're going to create a problem because you, they're going to see the empty lanes after that, the empty lane, and they're not going to believe you. If you make it too short, you're still going to have a lot of uh, 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 forced lane changes. So the traditional method of coming up with controllers, because if you look at, if you write down the dynamics of every vehicle and how they connected and the lane changes, you're gonna get with four or five pages of equations. And you don't know what to do with them, okay? So the idea in controls in engineering in general, we come up with, and that's where the engineering intuition comes in, because you have to decide what is important to keep and what is not so important for the phenomenon you're observing, uh, observing to approximate and reject. So the idea here is to understand the physics of the problem and you come up with a simple model that allows you to understand what's going on, it captures the phenomenon, and come up with a controller that will do the job. So here what we started looking at, start the modeling part, so we want to model the bottleneck. And if you look at the, uh, this triangular diagram here, here was the capacity before the, before the accident. Because of the accident, the capacity dropped to this point, right? And because of the force lane changes, it went below this. So this here was 10,000. It went down to 8,000, the maximum possible you can get, but you don't get the 8,000 because of these force lane changes. You get one minus epsilon COP, which is the capacity. You get here. So what happens if you are pumping vehicles, if there is a high demand here, so the density in this section will increase and you go to along this line. And so everything gets stuck here. Now the speed of the flow is the slope of this line. And if, you are, uh, if your operating point is here, then you draw a line from here, that would be the speed of the flow. Okay, so this is a, a, a plot of the flow versus the density. The density is the number of vehicles per unit length. So, um, so the way we did it, we designed uh, uh, two kinds of controllers. One of them is the lane change control, where it, it, we decide about where to put the sign, change lanes, and, the, and what to say here, what is the recommendation. So the controller here is not dynamic in the sense of time, but is, uh, depends on the spacing. So we came up with some empirical way where the distance uh, where you put your sign change lanes is 
some parameter x times n, n is the number of lanes that is closed. X is the number of parameters, is a parameter that depends on the demand, how many vehicles are trying to enter the section, okay? So we did a lot of experiments on that, and then here, depending where, which lane is uh, blocked, you tell the vehicles, go left, go right, uh, and so on. So that's a trivial thing. So the first part is you decide where you start giving the instructions, and then you do it period, I mean, different uh, space intervals, and then you decide what to tell them to do depending where the accident is. In the example I gave you was in the center, so some vehicles you tell them go to the lanes to the left, some to the lanes to the right. So here is the result. So the top part is the open loop. You can see the, how they accumulate the congestion, and here how the flow goes in because the lane changes took place at the higher speed. So the vehicles, they're given the instruction, they have enough time to speed up, they find a spacing to cut in. And they cut in at a much higher, uh, I mean, at a higher speed instead of... Now, these simulations are not cooked examples that we took about and make the video just to make it impressive, right? These are run on a microscopic simulator that is a commercial simulator. We have no control of it. We apply our controller and we lay, press the button and we lay, let it run. Okay? So you don't know what you're going to get. But if it works, then you're happy about it. But the nice thing about this is that is we observe this phenomenon in real life also. It's not just uh, simple mathematics and some simulations. This is what you observe. In other words, you come up with something where the mathematics fully agree with intuition and what you observe in, the, uh, in practice. So here also the, <coughs> the analysis, how to explain it with the, on the flow, uh, uh, flow density uh, diagram. So all these dots are run uh, in a Monte Carlo simulation many times. These dots, uh, so if the demand is very low, so let's assume, as I said before in this example, the maximum capacity is 10,000 the capacity after the accident is 8,000, but that depends on the demand, how many vehicles are trying to enter that section. If the demand is very low, right, the accident is not gonna have any effect because you, the, you don't have many vehicles. So you're gonna be somewhere here moving at the flow at the maximum speed, which is the, tra uh, the speed limit. And as the demand increases, you get these points and so on. And here you come here that you are demand approaches your capacity. And that's when you have the, the, the control becomes very active, okay? If it's below, you don't, you, you're gonna, if, there, if there's an accident and the roads are empty, you go through it, right? It's not gonna, the accident is not gonna have any effect. The problem comes when the demand is higher than what you provide here. So this is the part that is very important. So the open loop control creates this line that means you get a lot of congestion because this is, this is the density. The density is, is the congestion you observe. You see, you go all the way here, high congestion. And the speed of flow, you draw a line from here, that means it's very, you're moving very slowly. So your traffic ta uh, the travel time is very low. With a control, you put it on a higher level here, higher speeds, so on. Okay, so that's, uh, is explained by also by doing a, a lot of Monte Carlo simulations with a microscopic simulator. Now, so once we did that, so the lane change controller reduce, eliminates the capacity drop. But there's another problem that you have this uneven uh, situation of speeds and so on, and you want to come, you want to, uh, and you have the high demand coming in. So you want to you want to protect your uh, that section of the road, your network, so that the flow is uniform. You have a uniform density and a uniform speed, and you achieve that by coming up with another level of controller, which you call the variable speed limit control. So you tell the vehicles upstream slow down or come to the speed that can be supported by the outlet after the accident because it depends where you are, it dep the, the speed limit will be depend on the demand, how many vehicles are trying to get in, and also the capacity of the road, and so on. So the idea is to provide uh, sp uh, variable speed limit 
recommendations. This is, by the way, is something that is already applied, the variable speed limit. You see it if you go to the airport uh, on M1 on, uh, in London, you're going to see these signs with the speed recommendations. You see many places in Holland and so on. And, and there's a lot, there was a lot of work. We did, we tried this variable speed limit back in the 90s after we did the intelligent cruise control, but then we, we didn't really understand it because we didn't also have uh, uh, software tools. So we started with a macroscopic traffic flow model, which is macroscopic traffic flow. It relies on the flow and the density and the speed. So it doesn't capture lane changes and all these things. So, so there was, they had this macroscopic simulation model where we'd come up, we used to come up with the speed limits. And everybody was reported 20% improvements in travel time. And we take that model, we, we, sure enough, that's what we get to with different controllers. Then this commercial software comes with a macroscopic simulator. Now you get it closer to reality. Uh, where in the microscopic, every vehicle is simulated. All the dynamics are, so the microscopic phenomena, lane changes, acceleration, deceleration, they are also simulated. Then you take this scenario where it gives you 20% improvement in travel time, you put it on the simulator, you get negative. The travel time gets worse, becomes worse. And I had a student who, uh, you know, spent five years looking at it, and she couldn't figure it out. So eventually, we had to channel her out, get her a PhD, how long? You know, she said, I'm too old now, I need to get out. So, and it, it, was, it was a real puzzle. And it was only when it came and I realized, uh, I experienced this problem of forced lane changes. And I got the idea one day, you know, one of these things, you wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning, you don't know, you know, you just can't have, uh, and you sleep and you think back and here you are. You say, it could be this. And the reason that we had this difference was the force lane changes that I showed you before. Because these force lane changes could not be captured by the microscopic model. So the model could not see that effect. And that effect was the cause of the capacity drop. If you have the force lane changes, it doesn't matter what speed limit you tell them. Unless you cut the demand completely down, then you see a difference, but you have the demand there. So, and there was, uh, there were people who are saying, well, the way to deal with the capacity drop is to go uh, 500 meters away from the accident, put a traffic light or some type of mobile traffic light and let the vehicle accelerate through. But that's not a feasible solution. Nobody will do that. So once we put the lane change controller with a variable speed limit controller, this consistency went away. Whatever you get with the macro, you get it with the microscopic. Very, very excited. We got very excited about that, uh, uh, you know. And, and then you feel very stupid, of course, because you say, how come I didn't think about it 10 years ago? It happened many times. And you feel so, <laughs> I'm not intelligent as I thought, you know. It's, um, so, then we went back and we said, okay, let's uh, look at the problem now. Let's develop this variable speed limit. Uh, one of the issues of this variable speed limit, the way they did it literally, they use model predictive control for people who understand what it is, which is very computationally incentive. So practically, it's uh, questionable whether you can have it. So the other the, the things that is commercialized, they use some ad hoc methods. Uh, to, to do the variable speed limit. So I said, why don't we start doing it? Let's, let's give it a try. Maybe you come up with something simpler and better who does the job also, because it appears that the problem is very simple. So I look at the equation that if there is a the, uh, flow, it's a partial differential equation, but we make it even simpler, because if you take a, a section of the highway, let's forget the lanes between, let's assume that everything is uniform, and you have flow going in, flow going out, okay? If you take the difference of what's going in and what comes out, is what's gonna stay in, right? Vehicles don't disappear, it's called conservation of vehicles. Vehicles do not disappear. So, and that difference of the two flows divided by the length will give you the growth of the density inside that section. But that density grows, but how does it grow? 
because it will depend if there are vehicles. If the flow is very low here, you're not going to create congestion here. So it depends. And here, what comes out, how many vehicles get out of this section, it depends on the capacity here and what is in this area. So then you create a situation which is something like this, which is the minimum of V times rho, which is the slow of this diagram here. So if you're here, if the demand is somewhere here, right, you're going to have this guy. If the demand is up here, you're going to have this. And if the initial condition is somewhere here, you're going to have this guy. You're going to have this equilibrium point here. So you get a sequence of equilibrium points on this, on this curve, depending on the situation. And there are many situations. Let's see if it's to so work out all the possible situations. Here is the capacity at the bottleneck. And if this is this, then you, so you have one, two, three, four, up to, uh, what the hell? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine different situations, depending on the flows and so on. And these are the situations that you get a capacity drop if you let the, uh, if you don't control it. And here, there is no capacity drop, so this is a, a more control may not be needed in some of these cases. So for each case, you can uh, get stuck at the particular point. So look at the, uh, this case here, the fundamental diagram, right? If the demand is here, you can either be at this point, which is a high speed, low density, or you can be at this point and still have the same flow. So a good controller is the one that takes this point and pushes and brings it up here. And the only way to do it is to slow down the vehicles that come in, that generate the, uh, the demand. To tell the demand, uh, you, you want to go in, you are 10,000 vehicles that want in, guess what, I can only accommodate 8,000. So I'm going to slow you down so I can get the 8,000. And then we talk about what's going to happen to the vehicles that we tell them don't come in. Okay, we, we analyze that also. So let's, let's take, here I don't have time to go through all these equilibrium analysis and so on. Uh, but so I go directly to the controller. So we consider the case where we really need the control. The demand is higher than what you can accommodate. Okay? More vehicles you want to go through the bottleneck than the bottleneck can carry. Okay? So we write down all the equations, so on. Then we know that the desired point, so initially you are, the demand is somewhere up here, okay? Initially, before the accident, you were on this di triangle, right? You could have a high flow, so if the demand was here, you probably would be somewhere here at this point, operating at this point at the, at the high, uh, high speed, uh, speed limit. But because of the, of the uh, accident, your capacity went down here, your demand is up here, so your demand is higher than the capacity. So ideally, you want to control the system so that you are at this point. You get the maximum flow uh, or that your uh, bottleneck can accommodate. So w once you find that point, that defines the equilibrium point you want to be. You subtract, you create an error equation. And, and the error equation becomes more equations, and so on. And because I know you're not going to follow all these equations, so you create a system like that. You, uh, before that, you choose a controller. The controller is the speed limit that you want to uh, calculate and tell the vehicles upstream. And if you, uh, it's a kind of nonlinear feedback linearization type of controller that gives you a linear system that with a certain design variable, and you have a theorem that says, if you give these speed limits to vehicles, then everything will converge to this uh, optimum point, which is the tip of the triangle. And the proof is kind of trivial, actually, is to find the eigenvalues. Now, the question is, uh, what if the, now, we said the demand is higher than what can I come, uh, uh, accommodate. Right? So when I present the, presented this result, they said, fine, that's good. You found a sweet spot that you can do this. But if the demand is higher, 
than the capacity of the bottleneck, what's going to happen to the vehicles? The vehicles are entering. They want to go to Nicosia, but you tell them somewhere in Valley, hey, you have to slow down because I'm not letting 10,000 vehicles to go in. I can only take eight. That means you're going to create a queue, right? Which is going to keep going. It's going to grow. So they say, well, what have you solved? You transfer the congestion problem from here to there, OK? And I say, well, that's not a good comparison. The good comparison would be is that if I do nothing, what situation do I get? How big is that queue if I just do nothing? No control versus applying my control. So what we show here is that if you do nothing, this queue will uh, um, increase much faster than if you control it. And intuitively, it makes sense because by telling the vehicle to keep away from there, you maximize the outflow on the other hand. Where if, the, if, you, put it, if you leave it open loop, the outflow due to the capacity drop is going to be, let's say, 6,000 vehicles uh, per lane, so, uh, vi six vehicles, uh, 6,000 vehicles for the three lane, four lanes, versus if you apply control, it's going to be 8,000. So 8,000 vehicles getting out of that will help the others who are coming in, okay? Much better than the 60. So that's, that's kind of uh, obvious. But anyway, we, we show it because some people don't believe it. Then we apply this to, uh, to a microscopic simulator in an area in Los Angeles where we close to the ports, where we also have tracks and so on. And here are some of the results we show that, uh, you know, this is at the enter in the section. Obviously, there's an accident here that one lane closes, and then it opens after 30 minutes at this point here. So the section that before the our network has creates a queue, but all the other sections are moving out, and they create the, uh, the maximum speed here. You can see here that the speed is at 65 miles per hour. So the travel time is uh, guaranteed to be much better, and so on. So here is the other case where without control, you can see here if the accident is removed, the congestion stays another 10, 15 minutes later. So for people who drove in big highways, you are driving and all of a sudden you come full stop. And then you speed up and you go, and you say, why? The, the roads are all empty. There was an accident 30 minutes ago somewhere. And that short wave stays there for another 15, 20 minutes. So people stop, they stop, and then they accelerate. The roads are empty, but yet you come at full stop because you get hit by that short wave. So that doesn't happen with a variable speed limit, as you can see. See, right after the accident, you recover. Here, it keeps going further. So all these things that uh, we are doing, we are able to explain with simple equations, relatively simple problems, but yet we capture the essence of the practical problem. And then this is what you experience also. So you see the simulation, you see the simple model explaining the phenomenon, you go to the microscopic model, which is a more extensive simulation, you see the same thing, and then you observe with real data, and you see the same thing again. So that's, uh, that's in that sense, you, you are very lucky uh, to be able to creates more confidence that what you are doing is the right thing to do. And here are the Q sizes. You can see in the open loop, you get a much higher increase versus the closed loop as so for different cases. Again, here are some more microscopic simulations. And here are the uh, part of the fundamental diagram. You can see here that uh, every little color here involves about 10,000 different simulations. So the computer was running for three or four weeks with all these different cases for different demands and so on. And the other thing we've shown is that uh, you probably cannot see here, but because of this control and smoothing the traffic, you get improvements in, uh, in uh, pollution, in uh, the number of stops, which has impact on safety. So there are a lot of benefits by smoothing the traffic and controlling the, uh, controlling the flow. Lower pollution, less fuel consumption, le less number of lane changes, uh, less number of stops, which has a safety impact. So the benefits of control are go far uh, further than we can think of. 
And of course, here we can create a coordinated system where we include also RAM metering, so you have another flow from the RAMs, and so on. And the same thing again, uh, uh, you get, uh, uh, you get the, the same type of controller. So it's a simple controller, can be easily implemented. But then we said, okay, everybody, all the community that are talking about this modern predictive control. And we had a visitor from uh, the group of um, Zurich, which the guy was uh, uh, really believing in uh, uh, modern predictive control. That is that very when I told him, look, you, no matter what you come up with, you cannot beat our controllers. Why? Because there's only one point to go to, and you go to that exponentially fast. So there's, you cannot go faster. You cannot converge faster than an exponential in a dynamical system. So no matter what method you come up, you cannot beat that. You can, you can at least come as close as, as possible to that. And then sure enough, we run because the, the kind of model predictive control they apply, they don't have the analysis, they jump, but it, it works. So we took that controller, we ran it, sure enough, it works very well. It requires more computations, more computation and incentive. So well, that's good, okay, well, you have a good method. But then I thought about it, and I said, okay, well, uh, we have to beat that. So I knew something about robustness, so I said, okay, so the model predictive control was very uh, model dependent, because exponential convergence that we guarantee is also robust, so you have a small uncertainty, uh, you get a bounded error. So for people who are into stability analysis. So we, because we guarantee exponential convergence, we also have robustness. And I know model, predict model predictive control does not guarantee that, cannot guarantee that, I don't know because there is no analysis. The most likely, the robustness issue may be questionable. So sure enough, we we run. Uh, oh, where am I? Going? Do I have the? We run the. You can see that we change a few parameters around of the system. Our controllers stay with the same type of performance, and their performance from 18 percent, 20 percent went down to one or two percent. So that was the. Uh, finale of the comparison of the two, even though there's no way to use the model predictive controller to run all these computations, when you have something much simpler, computationally, we achieve the same result. So under the same conditions and so on, the two give the same performance, but one requires more computations, and in addition, is less robust than the simpler one. So just to... Uh, Conclude with this, uh, we develop, this is an example, by the way, we have many more phenomena to control. So this is an example of controlling a bottleneck where we follow the traditional control method, a model, understanding the physics of the problem, coming up with the simplest possible controller, and going through the process of uh, testing, and so on. So there are a lot of other problems, and I, can, I don't have time to uh, talk about, but there are also more complex problems. We have simple problems, uh, simple models do not work, and one such problem is in the routing of vehicles. So if you want to go from here to, uh, let's say, to, from point A to point B, and you put on the navigator, I'm here, uh, this is my destination, it's going to look at, it's going to run its uh, A-star algorithm, whatever they do, the Google Maps and ways and so on, and it's going to find the minimum time route. However, if a, if a thousand people ask who want to go from the same origin to the same destination, it's going to put all of them in the same route. So if all of them follow that recommended route, that route gets congested. So it's no longer a minimum time route. And that comes a lot with ports. What's that? We solved that. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so uh, the, the problem, the way to solve that problem, because is because in the case of trucks, you don't know how one truck will affect the flow, or two trucks will affect the flow, and so on. So you need the function to do the optimization. But that function is complicated. So if you try to solve the optimization uh, uh, using those functions, you are not going to be able to do it. Uh, it's very complex. So we came up with what we call the co-simulation approach, where we use online simulators, traffic simulators, to generate the states in real time. So the argument of using that is that in the old days, when you had analog computers, you had very simple uh, models. You couldn't use complicated controllers because 
you couldn't implement them anyway. So it was very simple. Then digital computers came up. Then we started making the controllers uh, the, uh, more complicated. Then computations become much faster, more memory. Then we went to non-linear, more complicated controllers. Now we came to the point that uh, you have so much computational capability that you don't need, you are not constrained by these simple mathematical uh, models. You can use simulation models in real time to generate the states that you need. So here, we put this in a Dulu, in a, some feedback loop where we, the, we come up with, let's say, we want to uh, route 1,000 tracks from the port. We just uh, come up with a minimum route. We come here, we test the minimum route. We see that it gets congested because there is no anticipation. Then we do something here, some process of changing the loads. Then it creates new states. Again, optimization. The optimization is always convex. It's point-wise in time, so it runs very fast. Then we keep going until we set up. We find the right mix of distributing the load. And here is one example where we simulated, just to understand the complexity of the problem, we have 12,824 uh, 12, links, 4,747 nodes, and we also have RAID, and we want to route uh, uh, 3,060, I mean, it, we have three users, uh, 1,020 each. They want to route to different destinations here from the ports, and they send that information to a central coordinator. The coordinator does this balancing that I mentioned to you with a simulator. And if you look at the, these are based on real data, by the way. So if everyone was following Google Maps or Waze, the total cost would have been here. As we start doing iterations with our approach, the cost keeps decreasing. And after uh, 2,000 iterations, we bring the cost down to some uh, settling point. And the procedure is such that mathematically you can prove that you can only, always go down. There's a limit because there is a lower, the, the cost is positive, And you guarantee that it's non-increasing. So it has to go to some limit. We just don't know how long will it take. but we can stop anywhere you can stop, you still get the benefit. So another uh, problem, control problem, is the traffic light control with track priority, where you know sometimes when the truck comes to the traffic light, it's better to control the traffic light to give it a little bit green so it gets out of the way, because the truck takes longer time to stop and longer time to accelerate. It's a heavier vehicle. So by doing that, you help the passenger vehicles also. By not my helping so the truck doesn't stop at the intersection, you are helping, you benefit the passenger vehicles also. So this is something that we prove here. And we use again the same approach with the cost simulator. And we put similar things with trains, again with the uh, connectivity. And so the point I'm trying to make with these exercises and control management is that connectivity is a key technology in, in achieving transportation efficiency. It's something that is coming, it's going to be implemented, but it didn't receive the uh, emphasis that it deserves because the show is stolen by these autonomous vehicles. Everybody's excited. I can call the car, the car comes outside my house, no driver, I open, I sit, I read my book, and it takes me. I don't even need a car to buy a car. This is that's what uh, in, in one uh, 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 committee that I was uh, talking, uh, we were discussing these things, and I was raising well, autonomous vehicles. Is it, you know, there are safety issues. And there was a guy next to me. He said, "You better don't say that because me and you were getting old, and we need this. We will not be able to uh, uh, to to drive, and we, we need mobility." I said. You are insulting me. He said, why? You are, I'm not getting old. <laughs> you get old. <laughs> I will keep driving. Um, so anyway, so there are a lot of people who think this is really a good thing, uh, except they don't think about safety and other things. I'm just seeing, uh, I was an expert witness in three accidents where um, the vehicle, without even being autonomous, okay, no automatic, you just drive it, and the vehicle takes off. It accelerates like crazy. Go to 120, 150, and the guy gets killed. San Diego, four people. 
and uh, the driver was a policeman, Lexus RX 350, gone. Uh, in uh, Utah, the other case uh, I was involved, four people, two people died. And the vehicle took off, it couldn't, uh, it couldn't stop. Uh, another case is Santa Barbara, with uh, the, the mother of someone that I know who did a PhD with the same advisor. They, parked, they went, they went there to park their Toyota Camry, it took off, it went over the hill, the mother died. And the car figured it out. 60 people from NASA, look at 250,000 lines of code to figure out what went on in the software. Everything looks fine. Then in, uh, in, uh, in the group of the lawyers who went in, we figured out what, what was going on. So the throttle gets uh, uh, stuck in the open position, and you try to brake, you lose brake. So what would make the throttle get open is the gas pedal gets stuck, and the only thing you need to do is to move the gear to the neutral. Okay? How many people know what the neutral gear is? What does the neutral do when you put the gear in the neutral? What does it do? Okay. Everybody knows that it is a gauge. It, it takes away the torque of the engine, so the torque doesn't move the wheels anymore. So when you press the brakes, the only thing you uh, overcome is the kinetic energy of the vehicle. Otherwise, you try to beat, you plant the brakes, you need to beat the torque, the, the force that comes from the torque, from the engine, and the kinetic energy. And you need a lot of power, because if you lose braking, because of some other technical things I don't have time to discuss. And now the, I'm also looking in, uh, in another case, the same unattended acceleration with an Aston Martin vehicle, 2008. And when you hear these things and you say, my God, now I'm going to have cameras, I'm going to have radar, LIDAR, everything electronic. The Tesla has a screen. <laughs> and you, you press, put. And a friend of mine, his wife, was backing up uh, the vehicle from uh, the driveway, a Tesla. And as she, as she was going backwards, it took off, it hit the wall, $25,000 uh, damage to the vehicle. Uh, she called me and we were trying to help it with a legal issue here because it's definitely a mistake of the vehicle because it's supposed to have braking override. And the lady's alive because the wall was just two meters away. It didn't have enough time to create because the collision energy is proportional to the relative speed. So if you have, if the wall was further down, she would have been definitely killed. So these things are uh, very dangerous, so safety, uh, a lot of these autonomous vehicles have artificial intelligence, which the designer doesn't even know what they do because they are learning as they go along. A lot of neural networks. And the first thing, if there is an accident, the first thing they need to know, the lawyers need to know, what is your design doing? And these guys say, I don't know. <laughs> it's learning by itself. And there was also the accident with the Tesla in, uh, in uh, Florida, where this guy was uh, uh, putting it on the autopilot driving around, he put about 30,000 miles. He was putting it on Facebook. What a great technology. Reading, showing that he was reading, he was watching uh, DVDs and movies, and the vehicle was going happy, and one, da one day, as he was going, a big trailer, the biggest possible vehicle on the road, cut the front, and he missed it, and he went under. And he was mashed, and the guy got killed, and the, there's a lawsuit about it. So the radar was too low, it went under. The radar low saw a white, a white frame in front of it. That's not an obstacle, right? That's air. And uh, it didn't signal the brakes. Anyway, so this is, this is my story. I hope I, I mentioned all those things to make it more interesting, okay? So. Uh, <laughs> Anybody investigated the idea of having a centralized system 
for example, the road or the road network can control the actual trajectory of the vehicle, of each of the vehicles? Well, I mean, uh, in principle, yes, uh, you can do that, but I don't think, I think the biggest problem they have right now with autonomous vehicles is the perception of the environment. So what they do, um, uh, these companies, they go, they choose the route, they say this vehicle is going to follow this route. By, by, by the way, the companies that uh, are very much interested in this is Uber, Lyft, this taxi, uh, because they want to get rid of the driver, and to them, it, right now, they are losing money. If they get rid of the driver, they will become profitable. So what they do, they take, they go and they, they, um, they videotape everything, the, the whole route. So they know this super vehicle is going to go with this route around and come back to this point. So they videotape everything, so they make it more like, so they reduce their certainty. Now, you know, at this point, at this waypoint, there is a tree and the tree may have a shade, and so on. So that's how they uh, go around it, uh, and that's where they're focusing. Another, uh, another interesting option is to, for the infrastructure to develop sensors that can, be, uh, can help the sensors of the vehicle. Okay, so that, that's where the focus is going on right now. But to control the vehicle from the infrastructure, you, you input the trajectory, the, I don't think the infrastructure is ready to take that responsibility. And because the two are not talking, you know, like now they want, for example, the simple thing to put a transponder on the a receiver on the, along the road, the California the Department of Transportation doesn't want to do it because it's costly. Someone may damage it and so on. That would be the simplest thing to connect the vehicle because the vehicles have the technology. And they don't know. But these are ideas that uh, could be sitting in front of a big screen and having your vehicles, your trucks, let's say freight truck, and you guide them where to go and what to do and so on. That's define the trajectory. That's it's a futuristic, but in principle, uh, you can say that it could be done. But the problem is the perception. Yeah, I mean, you, I could come up with many solutions how to avoid that. I mean, if there was vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication or if there is another, uh, an image of the road or, I mean, communicated to you and, and, and or if you, the heading of the car was going in that direction, a warning comes up, there are many ways to avoid that. But you need that connectivity and that information. Yeah, but you don't need you don't need the system is very slow. If you the speed of communication. Well, you're talking about seconds, ten seconds. I mean, you're, the only thing you say is slow down when you can. So that's not that's not a big game. But the communication become very important when vehicles communicate with the vehicle behind and say I'm braking, you brake too. That's a problem, because if you lose a communication and you expect it, yeah, then it's a problem. But in this case, in, yeah, in this, yeah, exactly. But in this case, even if you lose the, if you, if you lose the communication, you, yeah, safety is not affected, because you have the driver. You have your sensors on, if it's autonomous. So it's not a problem. Plus, the compliance thing, even if not all the vehicles Let's say not all the vehicles got the information, not all the vehicles respond. You only need one in a per lane to slow down. It slows everyone behind it. So in the case of the variable speed limit. Yeah, yeah. 
Lane changes is a different story. So, but uh, you know, so the, we we look into these things and uh, reliability of communication. But in this case, it's not is not an issue. In the case of braking, you know, waiting from the vehicle in front of you to tell you when it's braking, so you can brake too. Then that's a problem because the you can lose communication for a second, and that second is can be can be a collision. That means you. To be safe, you have to add that second in your spacing, yeah. and then you create a big, big spacing. So it's not a. Uh, Chris. I have a, maybe you mentioned this, I have a question about the case when the lane had a problem, let's say, in the middle of lane. You sort of divert cars to the lanes on the left and the lanes on, and the lane on the right. Would it make sense to also divert cars from things that are not necessarily broken? Because you might want to also utilize more lane one. If you are operating yeah, uh, to yeah, that's a that's a good point. You can you you in this case in this exercise we we don't do per lane. Okay, in other words, we don't con now the, this this work is extended to control traffic in each lane, okay? So, uh, and then you tell, then, you know, you don't send, exactly. And then you have uh, the lanes to on one side at the high, and the fast lanes, the other lanes are the slower lanes, because the, the trucks are moving on the slower lanes, so you can take this problem into, but it's much more difficult problem, that, that one. Because you also have to think of compliance, uh, people are competing for space and time, right? But we feel that if you tell them the, the lane you are in is going to be blocked soon, they're going to change lanes, you know? So unless, unless it's too far, that's why we, we have to come up with a point that is uh, it's going to work. Because if you tell them very far ahead and they go in and they change lanes and they see this empty space, they're going to get in. So you want it to be at a point that is not too far from the accident. Any other questions? Thank you, Professor. It's a very inspiring. It seems to have a lot of the dynamics of this uh, system, even if we are not anxious, like you said. My thought was, uh, of course, uh, I understood the reliability of the infrastructure to send some information to detect something and also inform other way Oh, yeah, I mean, people do it right now. If they see an accident, they press, yeah. they, they report it, and it, they, I mean, these cell phones help a lot. So that, that you can do, you can do that and say, okay, well, if, uh, if people do A, B, C, then this is what is going to be the effect. The infrastructure could be, the vehicles could communicate with each other and do it by themselves also, without the infrastructure getting involved. Now we are talking about technology that if every vehicle has a box that we just, in some cars is, is already available, it has a box that if you, if you get into an accident, it knows whether you should call an ambulance because it was a high impact collision most likely, especially if the airbag comes out, then there is an injury. They communicate directly with the ambulance and the police and the fire department and it's amazing the response is I experienced a, a lot of accidents and it's amazing how fast they show up within a minute I don't know where they are and they bam they show there right away so it's because the vehicles the vehicle technology already sends a signal and they there are people scattered around and there's a lot of also work how do you deploy uh, the police and the fire partners or the ambulances so that uh, they get at any point at the fastest possible way. So there are a lot of things that are happening that we don't know about it even, and it's, uh, it's uh, really amazing. So 
the vehicles now began to have a black box. So in the accident in Utah, for example, we look at the black box. We knew exactly what happened, at which point the airbag kicked in, at the more, uh, point of collision, the severity, the relative speed, the brakes, what happened to the brakes, what happened. It's a lot of information. So they borrowed that technology from the, from the aircraft. Now the, the vehicles are becoming more electronic. When you press the, press the gas, you don't open the valve. The, the, you press on a potentiometer, it goes into the control unit, and, and the software decides how much to open the throttle. The braking system is by itself. It's, uh, it's connected directly to the wheels. So when you uh, press the brakes, it goes directly to the wheels and grabs them. The only thing that it does is that it takes um, vacuum from the engine and, ma and uh, amplifies your force. So if you lose a vacuum, like in these cases of an attended acceleration, if you lose a the vacuum, then you cannot uh, apply effective brake unless you go to the, uh, to the neutral. And when these phenomena take place, most of the people uh, fail to think about if the guy in, in the, the, the guy San Diego with his wife and two children, if you will push the gear to the neutral, we would have been safe. Just a simple thing, but people don't know because how often do you use a neutral in an automatic car? Never. Only when they tow it, but then you don't, you're not the one who's towing the car. So the guy comes to tow your car, he puts it in the neutral, you don't know what he's doing. But they, with the manual driving, people know that uh, with the clutch and so on. But I asked 10 engineers, by the way, what is the role of the, because in this uh, legal process, uh, how many of you know what the neutral is? And seven out of 10 engineers, we're talking about engineers, they didn't know. Three of them knew, like uh, our colleague there left. So uh, that was an interesting case, but Toyota settled with one billion. So everything was close. We were having fun for a couple of years, but uh, it's scary. Oh, I gave you the I, I gave you the algorithm. It's some uh, empirical parameter constant c that is a function of the demand uh, times the number of lanes that they are closed. That defines the distance that you're going to put your first sign. And we did that by running a lot of Monte Carlo simulations to see. There is you cannot do you cannot do it. Yeah, it's, it's you you do it by simulations. So people, we are neglecting now that we can do a lot of things with simulations. Uh, and uh, because of the capabilities and so on, uh, so it's, it's, it's becoming a very useful tool. Because the traditional way was theorem proof, algorithm, run simulation, but now you have another dimension that you can use this computational capability, which the computer scientists use very much, but uh, we can use it in controls too. Okay, but the, the modeling, the model, the modeling part sometimes is more important than the control part, because if you don't, you say, what is the model of the system? That's a very obscure question. If you ask me what is a good model for the system, I say your question doesn't make sense. It depends what you are trying to do. So if you tell me that I'm going to do failure modes and effects, and I mean failure modes analysis, I say why well, I need a good model of the system. But if you tell me I want to do control, then you need a simple pro, uh, model. So it depends, the model becomes, it's a function of what you're trying to do. So if you choose, so in the case of, uh, of the uh, problem that I'm examining, the macroscopic model is not supposed to model lane changes to capture that phenomenon, because it averages everything. So that phenomenon was not captured in that. So if someone would notice that the cause of the problem is the lane changes, that person would not use the model. Say, I cannot 
because it doesn't capture the phenomenon. So how can you control something that is it's all average and you don't know what's going on? So you have to notice the, so that's why understanding the physics of the problem is 90% uh, of the, in the range of importance. Okay, uh, thank you, Petro. Uh, thank you. Thank you for coming.